Thank you, everybody, for coming to the moot. This is a moot, uh, the midsummer moot. So during midterms, we have this one moot uh, every term. And this time, I kind of wanted to do something a little different than our traditional workshop and ritual. Um, last year at this time, we did a procession ritual for the for um, apprentice leadership. And we are going to continue on with that tradition and hopefully to make it a tradition on these midterm moots. Um, that is one thing that's happening today. Another thing that's happening today is we kind of did away with the workshop um, tradition that we've always used. Um, it is good that we know what people know, but it's even better to know what they know about gray school. And so in order to celebrate Gray School, to celebrate our apprentices, we have in, I have invited in, on behalf of the apprentice leadership several um, apprentices who received 100% in their coursework over this last three months. And they have agreed to come and share with us their 100% paper. And that is going to be some really amazing work. We will, um, for example, we will have, we have notes. We will have uh, Apprentice Morningstar. Uh, we'll share his Children of the Night um, paper. Um, I will share the uh, Core Energy 101 paper from Apprentice Suzuki Knight and Apprentice Medea Moonstone uh, will share the Common Magical Pests as well as her Wizardry 101 paper. Apprentice Looks will share the Don't Touch That and Vice Captain Sealer will share her uh, Meditation 201 paper and uh, we do have some time permitting so if uh, Anyone else, uh, apprentice, um, um, or apprentice Max Lara uh, has a paper, and apprentice Bron Brundle Spidder. If you have, um, if you brought a paper, we will definitely have time for that as well. So we have a full boat. We will definitely. Um, Get that done. But before we go into this celebration and everything, I want to I want to thank the VIPs. I want to thank the administration and headmaster for being here today, and I want to give them a few minutes to speak and and celebrate with us. So without further ado, uh, Provost, uh, Dean Servio, and headmaster, the floor is yours. Well, actually, as protocol goes, my name is invoked first, so I'm going to talk first. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's how that works, but I've jumped on the grenade. There it is. Um, well, well met, apprentices, and there's a, our honored headmaster and my, my most vaunted peer. It's a, a, it's a real cool thing to be here. I was going to say a marvelous thing, although I think just about every day here at GSW it turns into some sort of marvelous affairs. In, in the miraculous nature, we've become almost mundane. <laughs> Even so, I think we've accomplished some pretty amazing things this year, and I've watched uh, with fascination as our apprentice leadership has tackled its own interesting obstacles that it's come across. Uh, these sorts of things are the hallmark of a wizard, their ability to adapt, improvise, and of course overcome. I've watched uh, our captain do exceptionally well I just this and he's served his uh, his own lodge well by being a great representative of what it means to be a stones here at GSW but also is an excellent example of what it means to be an apprentice leader and a wizard here at GSW as well so excellent form to him I also like to give an excellent shout to our vice captain who has stepped up tremendously to fill the vacant role of waters prefect in addition to upkeeping her responsibilities as vice captain truly an excellent example of wizardry and continues to demonstrate why she is the recipient of the Wizard's Cap Award last term. Thank you. 
Now, in uh, the course of this year, we've got some pretty exciting things coming up. Uh, I will draw attention to our next big event being the uh, Conclave here at the Physical Campus. We're going to be making several announcements at the Physical uh, Campus this year. Uh, these will be live streamed on our Facebook page and group and the forums, wherever we can. So if you're not able to make it in person, you'll be able to tune in for these uh, announcements and, and things like this. One of these announcements uh, I won't talk about today. But the other one is that there is a new book returning to the rosters of GSW's archives, and uh, we'll have more to talk about it at Conclave. It's really going to be very exciting. And if, you, uh, if you're a Beasts Mastery major, you should be particularly excited. So those are sort of the big announcements on that front, though I will turn it over to Dean Servio, and then after him, Headmaster for uh, remarks on ceremonies and the happenings of GSW and beyond. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Provost. Um, this year, like all years, has seen its fair share of both opportunities and challenges. But I'm pleased to say that I've had the pleasure of watching my esteemed peers and colleagues within administration, our valued faculty, and our hardworking apprentice leadership collectively rise to those challenge and make the most of those opportunities. So, really in summation, what I'm saying is that I am very proud of each and every one here at Gray School, and I am deeply humbled to be able to be a part of it. And I would like to extend my thanks for being invited to attend this moot. Here, here. Uh, with that being said, I would like to uh, reiterate our Provost statement that the next big event coming down the pipeline will be our conclave at the physical campus. I've already made my travel arrangements and I am frankly bursting with excitement. I can't wait to see everyone there who was able to make it and to everyone who's not able to make it this year. Perhaps we'll see you at a subsequent year because of course this will become a long-standing tradition within the Gray School and become a major foundation in our school's life. Another major foundation within our school's life is of course the practice of ritual and ceremony. As wizards, of course, we understand the vital purpose of ritual and ceremony and its power and its potency in bringing people together into a collective whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. The ritual that we will witness or partake in today, uh, pertaining to the apprentice leadership, is the second iteration of a ritual that was previously devised and created by a joint effort between myself, the ritual club, and the apprentice leadership. And I firmly believe, based on past experience, that it will be a powerful, potent, and moving ritual. And I certainly invite everyone to partake of the energies and the, the psychological atmosphere generated by that ritual and internalize it and use that as fuel for your own excellence in the coming months. And with that, I turn it back over to the Provost. Well, here, here. Thank you, Dean Servio. Uh, I will pass the the metaphorical microphone to our headmaster, the illustriously bearded one, shepherd of trees and whisperer of birds, uh, Oberon Zell. Well, thank you. Um, and it's it's so good to be here with you all. This is a wonderful occasion. This uh, the school is now a, a little more than eighteen years old. It's um, it's it's just amazing to look around and see what it's like and how far we've come and what an amazing crew we have of faculty, administrators, apprentices, magisters. I'm so proud of all of you. It's, it's really very gratifying. I feel that my work here has been um, uh, well un, uh, received and, and doing really well. I'm, it's fulfilling my vision and my mission to an amazing degree. This is well, this is beyond my fantasies, actually, but um, I'm very, very pleased. The school had uh, started off with a rather ambitious vision, you know. We started off with just writing a book. And if the whole thing began with the grimoire, when um, I was kind of commissioned to write a real-life textbook for um, what would have been the Hogwarts if there had been such a thing. And um, so that was the grimoire. But the in order to do that, I convened the Great Council of uh, mages and sages and 
uh, witches and wizards and wise ones from the larger magical community whom I've gotten to know over my life. And uh, the assignment, the mission that we all undertook was to create a manual that we all wish we could have gotten a hold of when we started out on our path and one which we hope that we'll receive um, in our next incarnation <laughs> when we're ready for it. So I think that that's, that's worked very well. And then, of course, in writing the book, I kind of wrote it as a textbook. And, well, then there was nothing for it but to ha have to create the school for which that would be the textbook. <laughs> the kind of one thing followed another and another. And now look around. We have it, all of it. It's amazing. And I'm very much looking forward to Conclave. I will be there, as, as you probably know, and I'm looking forward to that. And immediately following Conclave, I will be off to Starwood Festival in Ohio, which is the um, one of the longest running, continuing magical festivals um, in the country. Uh, it's This will be the 42nd year, and I have attended um, the last 40 of these and look forward to doing that again, too. So it's nice to be a part of a larger community, and you all are part of this. By the very fact that you're here at the school, you are linked to a vast global network of a magical community, and you can go anywhere, and I have done so myself. I've traveled all over the world, and everywhere you go, there we are, and you will receive that kind of welcome and hospitality globally everywhere you go because the connection with the school gives you a ticket. So that's about it for my introduction. I will let the rest of this proceed, and thank you all very much for being here. Thank you, Headmaster. Yes, thank you very much, um, all of the admin, for, for everything you've done for the school and for the sacrifice. It's... Uh, it's something to emulate. Definitely something that we aspire to. So again, thank you for your effort. It doesn't go unnoticed. Here, here. Um, what the be of service. Oh, you beat me to it, Your Grace. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to unmute my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Edit that out. Awesome. I'm glad to be of service, my friends. <laughs> 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 That's great. All right. <laughs> so, you, so if if you have not already, at the end of your tables, you will see your banner, and underneath your banner, you will notice a color coordinated box on a pedestal, and those are the loot gifts. Those are the loot bracelets. Um, so that way you can you can wear a bracelet of your lodge. Um, today, tomorrow, and forever. And then at the end of the carpet here, where I am standing, this is the schedule of events for today. So you can keep that and put it on your uh, on your rock concert wall. And those of you who are not Gen Xers wouldn't know that, but that's okay. That's okay. We all evolve. And... Uh, we got uh, we got ten minutes, so that we can take a, a small break and transition to the to our lodges, and then at ten thirty okay. nine minutes. Yes, yeah, nine minutes. Uh, we'll be meeting at our lodges, and we'll at this point of the moot. We all split off to our lodges, except for Captain Mercado and I. Mercado because he was running this, and me because I had to record. And now, let the ritual commence.
Oh, okay, where's Mark? Are you? Welcome to the lodge. So now. I start directly. So, welcome, Captain Mercatil. Uh, we are honored by your presence. We consider you a request. Now I, I express in the name of the Wolf Guardians to preserve the wisdom of the elements of Earth and the sweet stones which barricade this lodge. Thank you, a great wolf. As as a fellow stone, as a brother of the lodge. I have learned from you great strength and great integrity that I have tried to found, tried to create a foundation and in so doing over the years I have succeeded in building this foundation of stone and helping those of other lodges learn from our strength and our integrity so that they can utilize the stone within them to build their foundations and raise to their heights. I ask for your advice and support as I transition to all the lodges today and ask for them to back me in my lead in this leadership. I ask for I ask for for, for your guidance. I ask for your support. Um, over the last four years, I have proved my loyalty to stones. I have proved my ability to build that foundation and to shore up the stones that, that build the walls that we, that we adhere to, that we emulate. Come with me, sir. Um, so, we always appreciate your loyalty and commitment, and it is a bless for us. One of her, Captain Mercatil, you naturally carry the blessing, strength, and wisdom of the Stone Lodge, which lies wisely those abilities to guide well. May you be impartial as the world's justice in pursuit of your duty and steadfast as the stone in your devotion to serve our community. May our strength and energy be immediately granted to you so that we have the solidity of the rock and the energy generated by this community. Thank you, Wolf of the Standing Stones. And Thank join you, me Captain. as we head to the country of the flowing waters. There we go, and yes. So for those of you on Discord, we are now traveling through the tunnel and going over to the Hey guys, editing Skywalker here. I just want to make a quick note of something. It was at this point of the ritual where the captain system decided it was a good idea to crash on him. So uh, until he came back, I had to stop recording. Let's uh, let's let's. Okay, so are we recording again? Skywalker. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Welcome, Captain Mercado. 
I am the great salmon, guardian and servant of those of this lodge. Tell us what you seek. O oh, great salmon, I come today to ask for your guidance and wisdom in leading these apprentices and this body we call gray school I have had to sacrifice a part of myself in order to take up the mantle I've had to kill the trauma within me in order to give life to transform into the life that gray school needs of me with the Vitae Mortem and Transformato, I ask the great country of the flowing waters and you, the great salmon, to guide me, guide my emotions as we transition and build this and build this foundation and and transform this gray school into its next its next its next greater level we have heard your request and believe you to be of good heart and strong character I am inclined to join your cause but I have to warn you emotions are a tricky thing they can push the ego and pull at the heart they have the force to shape perspective and in some cases even blind one to a larger truth like water itself emotions run deep and can be difficult to navigate if you are not prepared for the power they possess are you sure you're ready to experience the depths of the water element yes I am I have led this lodge I as vice captain and I have led this lodge as captain and I am willing and I I need the culture of the waters I need that emotion I need that passion in order to give the credit that this lodge is due very well you are granted with the compassion and intuition of the waters lodge that you may connect with those you serve and guide us well you will be blessed with the power of water and persistence of the salmon that you may persevere in your endeavors. May you use our flow to work with the other elements, shaping them as you go to serve the greater good of the school. We grant you our energy in this magical working and will join our efforts with yours. Thank you, great salmon. Please join me and the wolf as we go and beseech brother the dragon welcome captain thank you blue oh i'm running i'm not supposed to be running go ahead <laughs> i'm not supposed to be running i ran We're to get to you guys the right no i i ran to get to you guys i forgot to turn it off <laughs> as was mentioned <laughs> with water Right? Right? Mm hmm. All right. Plus, I'd like that you lead us to the next element at work. <clears throat> I'm crying. That was well done. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's not intimidating at all. <laughs> Everybody should be muted. Not part of the ritual. Oh Your microphone should be muted. <sighs> oh, great dragon! I come to you today to ask for your wisdom and guidance once again. Before I came to you as, before I came to you as the vice captain, trying to fit in as the prefect in order to channel my inner fires, today I come to you as the captain, 
asking for your wisdom once again for your ignis passio that I can give the passion of the flames to those around me well draconis you have taken on the name of a dragon and what is it you would do with this power of the dragon with the power of the dragon over the last year I have led the flames lodge with the power of the dragon over the last year I have built the foundation of this captaincy with the power of the dragon in this last year I have given honor to the flames through my passion through the red kerchief that sits above my heart I am an embodiment of once again your power well, I must say those are impressive answers you do know of course what comes with great power comes great responsibility O oh dragon indeed and how would you wield that responsibility by burning myself into the flames and re-emerging as what gray school needs not as what i need and what do you see the gray school may need from you they need me to listen they need me to channel all the elements into the ignis passio in which we can then distill the essence of the of what gray school needs and what gray school wants in order to then create the captaincy that gray school envisions well spoken well spoken so the rest of you gathered here do you feel that our candidate draconis here is worthy of the power that is to be bestowed upon him I, O oh great dragon, I do hear your words and this of the captain. I would follow him, if you will it so. And the rest of you, what say you? I do. I am the great salmon of the Waters Lodge, and I know this captain to be of good heart and solid character. I believe you should follow him. Well, Captain Draconis, it seems that you have support for the power that you would claim to wield. Therefore, you have my blessing as well. So mote it be. So mote it be. Please follow with me, great dragon, as we beseech the boon of the raven. And so it shall be. With the great power of the home button in the top left corner, I warped to the Winds Lodge. I did this because I realized that the captain was going to talk to me next and I had to be at the Winds Lodge before anyone else. As you can see here, I unmuted my microphone both in-game and OBS. While I was waiting for everyone to approach me, I invoked both the Great Raven, aka the Egregore of the Winds Lodge, and another spirit that I work with. But that's another story for another day. The fact of the matter is, both of them helped me gain the confidence I need to do my part of the ritual. <coughs> and... Well, you'll see. Captain Mercado, 
Salutations. The Great Raven welcomes you. Oh, Great Raven. It is fear that kept me from you, but it is not fear that a captain should have. I come to you today as an organizer, as a leader, as a coach and a guide. I support the prefects of wind as the, as the leader in his development, as I support all those that stand with me today. I have not neglected you for being a stone. I have <coughs> researched the archetype of the raven. I have researched your egregore. I have found the integrity that it is. Though I lead, I lead only through foundation. It takes vision to chart a course. And without the raven, I would have no vision. I ask you to join us in this in this endeavor to make gray school a better place to evolve to become the gray school we need to be i see it pains me to say this but we are currently unsure if we want to unite with you as the great dragon said with great power comes great responsibility Meaning, the same power that can be used to help others can just as easily be used to inflict pain on others. Both of our elements, earth and air, are natural opposites. They could be used to wreak havoc upon this academy if things go south. So tell me, Captain, how does uniting benefit the Winds Lodge? By uniting with us, the Grey Raven provides direction, provides vision. So that way, always at the forefront of any decision will be that vision of the Raven. The Winds Lodge will be the spirit, Amino et Fide. They will be the spirit and faith in which we are willing to step off the edge and know that we are stepping into something better with that direction. I see. And the rest of you? What do you say about this? I am the salmon of the Waters Lodge. I knew this captain to have the vision that he speaks of. I knew, I knew him to be intelligent and social and creative all things that are inspired by your lodge by you raven i think he is worthy and i think with your energy this school can go to new heights very well wolf dragon what say you Well, Please. yes, I do believe that he is meeting the requirements for the winds as well as he has for the flames. This is a fine captain we have indeed. I support him. I see. Wolf? As a stone, we support our captain, and we do believe that he will do a great job. Hmm. Very well. You have convinced us. You are indeed loyal and worthy of our blessing. We grant you the power and wisdom of the Society of the Four Winds. Let us spread our wings together and soar side by side with the other elements. Earth and air may be natural opposites, and uniting them may be risky. However... It is a risk we are willing to take. We will stand with you. Guide us well, Captain. 
O oh, Great Raven, thank you for your boon. Please follow me and grant me your vision. So at this point, we are all on our way to the Ritual Circle to wrap this up. At this point, I am walking around the Ritual Circle just to briefly show off the banners of all the Adult Lodges. Headmaster, if you would take your place by the by the flames banner. <sighs> Captain C. is not a right. Captaincy is a privilege. It is not as much a position as it is a sacred trust. I am not the director or dictator of lodges. I am the guardian of the lodges. It is my responsibility to listen before action. Though I want to act as captain, it is not my place to act, but my place to listen. It is my responsibility to take the credit for what we do well and also take the credit for what we do not well and with that we have the power as apprentice leaders to exact change to make things happen and to make things go wrong it is the responsibility of the captaincy to listen to the administration to listen to the lodges I am not here to exact change. I am here to be a conduit. I am here for you to leverage. Whether administration needs to leverage the captaincy in order for buy-in or for promotion, or whether the apprentices need to leverage the captaincy for legitimate power and influence. That is what the captaincy is for. That is what I am here for. I am here for you. Thank you all for the sacred trust. Thank you, Captain. And with that, the ritual concludes. Thank you all very much. This is I, I will be of very little words the rest of this day. Well done.
Welcome, welcome, Captain. Amazing, Captain. <gasps> Thank you all. Well done. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Headmaster. Thank you, Provost. Dean at Servio. Well, one is glad to be of service. Oh, so, yes. I think... Well done. I think <laughs> we've got time for a break if everybody wants to... Yes. Unfortunately, I had other things to do that day, so... The moment the ritual ended, I had to leave. However, the one who took over recording was the Captain Mercado. Here's the footage he sent me. Okay, so one of the things we did was to try to be of service to others, and in the Foundation of the Human Class, we talked about the healing aspect of that idea. One of the first things discussed was about being observant. What is the scene like where you are? What does the patient look like? Is this a situation that you can handle or do you need additional help? Uh, we also touched on creating a, a first aid kit, what CPR is, as well as self-care. Um, a healer must be physically and mentally prepared to help others, so self-care is vital to this. Wizards are also bleh, bleh, bleh. Wizards also help in magical affairs, but we can't just start playing spells to help someone because of ethics. Under most circumstances, you need to ask the individual to help them physically. If they say no, then leave them be. Um, the same applies to magical help, even if it's coming from a good place. Uh, bedside manner is also important, as the healer must maintain a calm confidence, which helps reassure the patient. I feel the role of being a healer of any kind is a very wizardly uh, act. In my paper, I had to list which skills I have that I can use to help others, so I mentioned my experience as an EMT and a massage therapist. I believe that the rules and guidelines for healers can be directly applied to our wizardry in most cases. All of these positions involve having good observational and listening skills. This will help in making sure you avoid tunnel vision, which, could co which would cause you to be distracted from a larger concern than what was originally being complained about. With that in mind, the biggest responsibility as a healer is do no harm. You need to help people if you are able or allowed to, and request additional help if the situation is beyond our limits. We need to be good listeners and be able to make those we are helping feel safe and as stress-free as possible. We also need to take care of ourselves before, during, and after helping others, and we need to be observant and show compassion in order to provide quality care. And those are my notes. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. So, how does this apply to your like, Um. How is this difficult to that? Do you mean like the magical aspect of it, or just as a wizard? Um. Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, again, going back to. Uh, the beginning um, that being a healer um, I feel is kind of a very wizardly act um, in that you're being of service to others you're trying to help others um, which is funny for me because I'm eh, I kind of meh about people I'm kind of introverted but I think it's funny that I'm always going into these jobs that involve interacting with people it's like okay but anyway um uh, so it's just, I guess, like this just desire to help. Yeah, um, the uh, ambivert. I just reserved. I don't know what I am. I am. <laughs> but, um. So, are you a healer or by trade? I mean, is that your, like, your real life job? Or? Yes. Uh, really? Yeah. Okay, fascinating. Yes, uh, I have a massage therapy license. I'm not actively using it, but I'm keeping it maintained because that test was a pain in the butt. <laughs> it's harder than the end. But, uh, but no, these are skills I want to I want to maintain them. Um, the job I have as an ENT right now is, is pretty lax. Um, some people think, like, oh, you're an ENT, you see all this blood and guts, and you're, all, you're always busy, and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, actually, no, my job is pretty chill. <laughs> I work at a casino, I just wait for little old ladies to fall out of their chairs, because they haven't eaten all day. But, um... <laughs> right. And, uh... Bom, bom, bom. So, so, yeah, so when you want to help someone, again, either physically or magically, you want the person's permission. Um, and this, um... 
it's just something that I guess kind of helps something to keep in mind when working in either field, either the magical or the physical healing. You need to ask permission. You need permission. For magic, does that always happen? Uh, no, but it's yeah. Um, <laughs> but ideally, yes, you always want to ask permission. You don't want to just go in there willy nilly and you know help someone who doesn't want help. Um, medically, there are exceptions to that. But um, basically, if they're um, if alert uh, and oriented, if know the name where they are about you know, what happened, that kind of thing. Um, and then if they're like passed out or dead, you have to assume that they want help. Uh, under normal circumstances, they would want. They would say, "Hey, yes, please." <laughs> um, but yeah, it is something that, uh, that is carried over back and forth between magical healing and physical healing. It kind of, kind of keeps the, the two in check. Well done. Okay, and, um, I have a couple of papers from Apprentice Suki Knight. Um, this this person is purple of one hundred percent. The one that uh, the core energy paper was the, the one that was a big one for. And then there's the don't touch that paper. So so I'll, I'll go ahead and leave those. Two. And now just a little bit of background about apprentice suit. Uh, Apprentice Suki is a PhD. Uh, is a future in acting. And so this gives I like it personally because as a PhD student myself, so, um, this gives kind of that PhD mentality to wizardry. And I want I have a certain perception of that. And I want to see how others perceive their, their role as a PhD at least. Um, like our apprentice Stone, apprentice Astra, is a psychologist and a wizard. And her blend of wizardry and research is just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I could never even conceive that. I, I'm always fascinated with people who have graduate degrees in research fields, how they apply that to their research. So, um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and read this one here by Apprentice Sue. Uh, as Provost states, grounding and centering practices are, quote, essential to all magical work and the foundation of any specialization. Therefore, I too must use grounding and centering perform my own medical work and have already seen the benefits of doing so prior to meditation and blessing rituals. For example, I have been practicing a water blessing ritual taught in the centering lesson. My practice of centering before performing the ritual may be affecting the blessing stronger by the end of the time. Hell, if I did not center before doing the blessing, the blessing was ineffective at all. By centering and grounding, I am able to focus more intensely, more, and remove negative energy more quickly, and more quickly to reach a deeper state of meditation. I can't imagine why a wizard, why a wizard would not need to know this practice nor why they would not perform the simple practice before casting. So that is simple and sweet to the point. So that is our core energy one of one hundred the focus of of setting the ground like in a nutshell. So in the final exam it was uh, 
That's fantastic. 
So yeah, and his, oh, his references were really spot on. He's got uh, White Goddess uh, yeah. over on. He did a quote. He did um, White Goddess. He used the element of fire and element of air. Over on, he used the remorse. Uh, he also used the four elements from Raven Song. Oh, uh, Raven Song, which is a uh, uh, Raven Song. Yes. And he also used first uh, the Water Man. And he also put a Provost course on the, uh, the, uh, the second thing. I use White Goddess a lot myself. White Goddess is interesting. I mean, I like her An interesting knight. I don't agree with all of it, but it is very interesting. Well, but that's the thing. They don't want you to agree. They just mm -mm. say, here's this. You know, make up your own demo. Here's one way. Right? Here's a way to make up your mind if it works for you. I like it. I like that a lot. That was well written. Showed a good understanding of the of the course. I agree, that deserved 100%. Yeah, that was really good. Especially for a level 1 course. Mm hmm. Organization. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I used to put everything into a mood folder. I have second life one <laughs> for the moods and the lodges. And everything would go in there for under the year. <laughs> Made it easy. It's time to do another inventory workshop. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. And then after that, a princess Midi Midia Moonstone will uh, give us a talk on um, common magical tests that is really well done. So, hey. The one thing you can see here, we got. So, this is midterm, and what this means in leadership is that now this is the transition. Not only, now that we have built, this is the kind of the apex of our turn for leadership. Now we're going on the down the slope. And so, what this means for, uh, for leaders is that this is the time for succession. So one thing that we're going to be focusing on as a leadership in these next three months from now until uh, the equipment is who's going to take over? And that's always been a question. And sometimes it's been a stressful question. Sometimes it's been a very easy question. There was one yeah, that was a, uh, a pre -cut. Thank you. Definitely. Yeah, I signed up and then I didn't know how to get out. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those I you're part of the herd now. <laughs> and that's, uh, well, and that's the thing you I must tell uh, Macy over there sitting in the 
Right. <laughs> yeah. I, w I will say, um, and I say this at every gathering we have, um, but it's just because I mean it. Um, I have just loved being in leadership. Um, that first term as prefect, you're kind of getting your bearings and you're figuring it all out. And before you know it, it's midterm and you're going, well, holy bananas. You know, I just, there's all this stuff I thought I'd do and I, I, I'm running out of time now, which is probably why I did prefect for four terms. Um, it takes that long to get it all done. And then there's still like, but this. But it's just, it's so fun. We had to have a talk in the Wind's Lodge about prefect Skywalker. Oh. And I'm like, oh no, sir. No, sir. Because coming into a leadership role with campaign promises, with ideologies, with an agenda, it does not make a leader. It Right. You manage things. You manage ideas. Meaning requires reception. Not being able to deal with the unexpected. Being able to scrap your agenda for what is needed by the institution. That is the yeah. And then being able to not lead. being able to lead from the front when direction is necessary. But at the same note, being able to lead from the back and make sure that you know what you I think there's also yeah. this sense of um, ownership. You, you start, um, I don't know, I just feel so much more connected with the lodge and the school and the people in it and um, I don't know that I ever would have done any of the stuff that I've done had I not been pushed to do it through leadership because it was required so I, I think it's worth it I think everybody should at least one term just jump in and do it wonderful sales pitch <laughs> I just, I mean, you, you may not want to, like, stay in it for... But it's also, <laughs> the, you know, there is a catch. Yeah. So, yeah. Really the catch is... Read the rules. It's a balance. You have... How much of your scholarship are you going to sacrifice for something else? How much of your... Because you will you be falling behind in your own oh, studies. Okay. Yeah, there's there's How definitely some work to be done. Your ambition, are you willing to give up to make sure that someone else succeeds? That's well, uh, the give and take. Uh, but that's also one of the lessons. Mm -hmm. Is we can all get so focused on, okay, this is what I want to achieve as a wisdom. Yep. When you step into leadership, it really brings home that you're part of community. And that a big part of wizardry is assisting others. So One is glad to be of service, as Provost says. Helping others, you learn as much as if you had been. Yeah, um, those of you who do not know, about a year ago, I had to be a And I said, Pointed. They were very pointed. One. They were very pointed and it wasn't, it wasn't sugar coated at all. And it required me to take a step back. I had to take a time off. That step back made me realize exactly how much it was not about. How much it was not about what I had.
so it, it was it was the government to come to Jesus Yeah, that was your your fire moment. You it flamed up. It, yes, it, I was flames prefect at the time. And it was yep. Fire <laughs> so, yep. So. That's what flames will do for you. <laughs> and you grew from, it. and that's that's the thing, and what we support in each other. Yeah. Because yeah. as someone who was there, I hold nothing personal against any of that. The fact that you learned and grew from it. That's why the situation had to happen the way it did. I, I don't really like the fact that ends justify the means because there's definitely more ways into the city than one. True. But in this only case, two ways. it wouldn't have been as important if it didn't go that way. It wouldn't have been as impactful on if it didn't go that way. Yeah. Well, stones are a little hard headed. Yeah. <laughs> the flames had to crack you open to me. What was it the provost called me see last sit stone? Sit stone, yeah. I didn't even know what that was going. What's a sit stone? Charcoal for it. No. That, that's what you it's called evolution, man. It's still happening and every day and every Every day is a moment. Someone's alarm going off. <laughs> yeah. 1230, is I it have, time for meds? I have, uh, <laughs> actually this was, uh, um, that was, I do have reminders for meds, but this was not the med one. This was, uh, this was the go feed the chickens reminder. Uh, uh, why don't you go do that? We'll take, a, we'll take about a 10 minute. Ten minutes enough. Yeah. Next. Yeah, and, uh, I had a bit of a question regarding one of the earlier essays. Um, one in particular regarding core energy practice and the specifics in which they mentioned grounding and how they would completely clear out negative energy and draw up positive. I forget who exactly was the... Uh, that was the right, last that one. one. I think that right. was Apprentice Suki. Right. Is that right, Suki. Mm hmm. Okay. Um. It seems like a similar concept tends to pervade those lessons as is, where you're banishing or getting rid of negative entirely and welcoming, well, trying to welcome in a surplus of positive. And I'm curious if there is any uh, added lesson further on in courses at later levels, or if there is, uh, how to put it, the, the notion put forth of achieving a balance there with them. Um, as the getting rid of one charge and bringing in a surplus of the other I find only ends up attracting more of what you just got rid of, as the two are not entirely without each other. You, you, know? you need one to understand the other. Exactly. And so wouldn't it be more prudent, instead of banishing and pulling in more of the other, that simply finding a balance within one's own space, try transmuting or directing said energy towards uh, different aspects. Perhaps angle the negative within yourself and within your given space towards uh, a goal. And the same with the positive, to where they're working instead of against each other, more in consort. Uh, I actually example. do that. I, I, I haven't had any classes in it yet, but I haven't taken as far along classes as others have. And that's fair. I'm only level two. I don't know what goes on in three right. and above. But I was curious if there was a point later on that where they would touch on that kind of a thing, where you're balancing those energies as opposed to issuing a supply demand. Or attempting a full conversion of, of what's right. in you at the 
because I've also been seen from uh, when trying to do it myself as well as from peers that that often ends up being far more destructive than if they were to simply balance what's there. I don't know what um, for that would definitely be in in the psychic arts, which is where core energy is. Um, mm -hmm. And I haven't dug deep enough to know what's further down. I just finished. In fact, my paper today is on the final that I did for Meditation 201. And it's mm -hmm. not so much... It's not so much specifically energy like we did in Core Energy where you're balancing and, and uh, grounding and all of that. But it's... I, I did find in the process of, of working with my meditation practice, um, I did find that I was clearing out and balancing within. That was kind of the process. It was focusing on the monkey mind, but then at the same time, um, I was making discoveries about myself and well, where did that energy come from? And yeah, what, okay. why am I carrying this around and that kind of thing? So I'm going to say, yeah, it's probably, I think if you stay in that department, if you follow some of those classes, I think the meditation gets you there. I think that's how, or at least it is so far for me. Okay. Well, you know, that's just how I, I, I personally work, balance, balancing. Right. Um, I, I am very prone to get, mm, let's say, overexcited, <laughs> overcommitting. <laughs> Sure. Uh, it's, uh, I'm dedicated to, to reaching my goals, otherwise known as stubborn. can be mm. a positive and a negative. Um, but I work very much with balance. Capricorns, um, that's never a negative. <laughs> I'm a Scorpio, <laughs> man. It's built into my seat, my cell, every oh. cell of my body. I'm, I'm a, starting to think... I'm a Capricorn as well. Are you? Mm -hmm. Well, there, there you go. Um, yeah. I'm starting to think that the negative energy that's kind of... My mantra here lately has been making space. Um, and that's physically, but also emotionally and, and mentally. I'm starting to think that the, the negative, we drag it around as, a, as if it is, it's a negative, and so it has weight to it. Um, but when we embrace it and incorporate it, um, it... it it changes. It it transforms into something that's usable, um, and it integrates. Yeah, yeah. And it is a part of the whole. It is a very definite type of energy. Um, well, everyone, yes, you just Excellent. Yay! Yay! Greetings. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So sorry for my technical difficulties. I'm here now. <laughs> You're fine. Welcome to the circus. You are not the only one who's had them today. Oh, trust me, I got totally you, would, out of you would think Mercury was in retrograde, but no, it's just Saturn giving everybody a rough time now. Yeah, <laughs> right? Saturn likes to do that. Is that why the computer shut down? <laughs> in the Sa middle of Saturn's all like, oh, you the think these structures work well, yes. right? Let's test that. <laughs> Is why everything's been going so well for me. <laughs> it's, it's the last little bits of the solar storm that happened earlier this week. They they act like it's a single event and it's just gonna flow in a few over the course of a day. And I'm like, no, that stuff lingers. Right. So uh, without further ado, Stephen, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, I will jump in and give you the fast forward version and then I'll just allow for some Q&A at the end of my time because I know we've only got a 15 minute slot, so, and it's already like halfway through it, so. <laughs> oh, we're not that precise. <laughs> okay, got it. All right, cool. So, um, all right, so I got invited here because I did what apparently was a really, you know, kick butt final for the Children of the Night class. Um, and let's see who is all here. Um, actually, I can talk a little bit freely because the teacher's not here. Um, part of my motive. 
<laughs> and and being very I'm being I'm, I'm being very blunt and honest on that <laughs> for what inspired the final. Um, I was actually not enjoying the class very well because of how the teacher was approaching it, and so um, originally I just supplied an image of my avatar because the final for that class is to you know create a model or or you know do an artistic rendering etc. So I thought I'm just going to take a picture of my fa uh, uh, of my uh, second life avatar because you know as far as I'm concerned this is a digital model I had to build it and put it together. Um, yeah. So I tried going that route and they're like yeah no nice try uh, that is, that's not going to fly I'm like okay we want all right somebody wants to play hard here got it. Um, so you know took some, sp took some space away from it and the other option was to write. Um, you know, a a short story on a creature of the night, and you know, you, and your spin on it. So after just taking some time and some space away from it, since you know, there's no you know hard hard and fast rules on how long you can take to finish a course. Um, I decided, you know, I gave it several weeks just just to percolate. Like, okay, fine, short story. You know, I haven't written anything in quite some time. What am I gonna do? Um, then um, Heartstopper dropped on Netflix, and uh, anybody here not familiar with what Heartstopper is? I am not. I have okay. Okay. Got it. All right. So Heartstopper is this wonderful story that has dropped on Netflix and based on a series of graphic novels, and it is a modern queer teenage. Um, realization coming into yourself and also finding connection with community from other with other young open queer people and oh, then also yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah and then also find and then also just sort of finding and literally tripping and falling into love <laughs> in that process like you know love unexpectedly being a byproduct with you know someone that you actually know and it's these two young boys who are you know one is already openly gay one has already re realized their realized their truth their story the other one completely clueless jock rugger at you know at their school and um, you know winds up being very winds up being in very close proximity with this openly gay student no homophobia at all whatsoever included in the script which is a very nice change of pace for a narrative story these days um, and so you know just through hanging out with this openly gay boy he starts to realize things about himself and by the end of the story you have this brilliant organically blossomed love story in the context of queer teenage space and I thought you know that could be really fun to mix with the children of the night story and I immediately connected with Twilight on that as well so the story that I wound up writing is a hybrid of Twilight and Heartstopper and so the the story that I wound up writing was a um, sort of an outcat, outcast, misfit young man who uh, is at a private school and um, has been an outcast, has never known any sort of like connection to group or normalcy, but then suddenly realized, you know, but then comes into the realization of, oh, I'm queer. And um, I, I did make this, I believe I made it, and it's actually been a little while since I read it, and I have not had the chance to go back over the story recently, so I'm just going off the cuff of what I remember what I did. Um, this particular, the, the, the character of the story centers around, um, has realized that they are gay, and they need to find someone, you know, they want to find a group, they want to find people that they connect with because they've always been an outcast, and they immediately think of this group of misfits that they've always noticed hanging about school, and they think, maybe I can find connection there. And so they approach this group of misfits, and um, in the process of making that connection with them, they discover, you know, people who are, you know, identifying as a non-binary, people who just barely adhere to the school dress code and are doing all sorts of funky, you know, funky hip things with their clothes that just barely, you know, sinks in with, you know, that just barely meets the standards so the teachers don't really fuss at them but at the same token it's absolutely their personal flair on how the on how the uniform works and just general like Aquarian rebels is what are what these kids represent. And the one person they connect with is somebody who is um, non-binary feels um, sort of like a sort of walks the threshold of being um, simultaneously bisexual but also pan 
sexual and their and, and their approach to life and their and their approach to who they're attracted to. You know, it's 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 you know, it's not about the ornamentation, but it's about the inner person. You know, you know that that's how they roll. And um, over the course of this story, there's uh, that you know, right after they first meet each other, they go off to class and. The you know the gay boy is just sitting there thinking about this person that they just met and just totally daydreaming, not paying attention to the teacher. The other the other boy um, who identifies as non-binary, so their pronouns are they them, and I'm very particular about that and how I wrote it. Um, they are sitting there staring out the window, and they're flashing to the night that they became a vampire due to the dean of faculty, whenever they were attacked in a gay bashing incident by the rugby team for just having peered around a doorway into the into the locker room because they heard something going on there like what's going on and they just happened to see the rugby team showering and you know they're not they weren't trying to be a voyeur per se but they're just checking out some noise that they heard and suddenly there's the rugby team showering all the workers see this they finish showering they get dressed they come out and they beat the crap out of this kid just for looking um, no talk, no, no conversation, no clarifying anything. Let's just beat this per person to a bloody pulp because they saw, because they saw our naked bums, like you do, you know. Um, and so the dean you know, of faculty comes around the corner, sees this poor child lying in a li lying in a pool of their own blood, and decide and realizes they're basically in the last few seconds of their life, and they decide, okay, I need to save this person like I was saved. And so this dean of faculty takes the student to their office. And you know they kind of black out. They, they they feel themselves being picked up, and then they kind of black out. And the next thing they know, they're sitting in a chair, and uh, they're sitting in a chair across the desk from the dean of faculty. And they're like, "So hi, how did I get here?" Um, and that's whenever the dean of faculty says, "So let me tell you how I got to where I am." And dean of faculty reveals, "I'm a vampire." And in our line of vampires, we see people who are generally good people, um, at, who who receive who are on the receiving end of really unfortunate terrible circumstances are within an inch of losing their life so we get we swoop in and we give them a second chance you know if their life is going to be stolen from them too early we prevent that from happening by giving them just a new type of life and so it goes to the story of how they became a vampire and etc etc and so, and so you know that this applies to you because i saw you lying in the pool of your own blood and, so, you know, I've, I've given you this opportunity. And at first the person was like, so, okay, what do I do with that? What does that mean? And, and so over the course of the rest of the story, they deal, you know, they, they're not only dealing with the memories of how they came to terms with who they are, but also recognizing that they're really finding attachment with this new person who's wandered into their sphere of friends. And... <clears throat> Basically, fast forwarding to the end of the story after it's just some character development and organic blossoming of you know of interest and whatnot, they find themselves on a balcony at the school, overlooking the rugby team, watching practice. Then they all decided it was be really fun to offer them cat. And even though all of the players at the time, who, who you know, gay bashed, who hate bashed. Um, the one person, they've all graduated and moved on. This is an entirely new team of people. Um, but, at the same, but by the same token, they don't care, and they and they they're standing on the balcony overlooking the pitch, and they're catcalling and um, shouting and being just generally obnoxious, and distracting, but also very funny in how they're doing it. They're having the time of their lives, and the rugby team's like, "What gives? What the hell?" Um, so you know, the rugby team's being tormented. They're having the time of their lives, and everyone who's who's looking on is kind of enjoying what they're watching because you know it's it's about time someone started tormenting the jocks. Good good for them. Um, <clears throat> yeah. From above, um, from a windowsill above, someone in the classroom isn't watching what they're doing, and falls backward, and l lands hard on the windowsill that happens to have a very, hev very heavily potted clay pot plant, and they knock it off the window ledge, and it's coming down, and it's aiming right for the new kid's head, and. Everyone sees this, and they're like, and, and all of a sudden they hear this, look out! And they all look up, and by the time they look up, the pot has fallen halfway down from the window toward them, 
and the one who realizes, because, you know, vampire eyes and strength and all that good stuff and all that hypersensitivity thing going on in their senses, they can see the trajectory as, oh my gosh, this is about to land on my boy. What the hell do I do? And because they've been with friends, they're not necessarily like the most clingy couple completely attached at the hip. Like, you know, the, the one was at one end of the friends and the other one was at the other end of the friends. Like, they're all just hanging out as friends. And so he's like, okay, and they're, they're like, okay, shit, I'm way over here. I'm not going to get to them in time. This pot's going to just nail them in the head. And so they go into their, you know, twilight speed vampire zoom run through the group of friends. And, and of course, you know, the pot hits and then basically just through the laws of physics connects with the head of the boy and then takes him right down in the fall and then shatters over his head on the balcony. And so, you know, he has cranial damage from this impact in this fall and so by the time his love gets to him you know he's already you know oozing out blood and you know and gray matter and stuff from the head and so you know they see what they need to do in this moment they're like i can't lose this person i feel too much for them even in the short time we've known each other i can't lose this person they glance up dean of faculty pokes their head around the corner has heard all this commotion it's like what the hell is going on looks to the hallway and they're like oh no and then they see who's there, and so Dean of Faculty looks at them and just nods her head. It's like you know what you have to do. Just does that. She doesn't have to say anything. There's no tele- tele- telepathic communication. It's just it's a head nod. It's like you know what you have to do. And then does sort of does a signal with a just you know does a little waving finger of come this way. She finds this. She finds a supply closet nobody pays attention to, and in, in, in an adjacent hallway. They pick up the boy into the supply closet, and you know she she looks at the one that you know she saved within an inch of within an inch of their life, and says, "Are you ready to do this? This is the first time you've had to do this." And they're like, "Yeah, anything. I don't I, I don't want to lose him. He's too special. Like I want this person in my life. I want to see where this goes." And she says, "Okay, you know what to do. I, I've walked you through it." And so they you know they they bite their boy, and. Within you know moments, you know, there's a there's a moment of blackout, and then boy starts to open his eyes. He's like, "So I was just on the balcony with you, and now I'm in the supply closet with the dean of faculty. What? Huh? What? What's happening? What's going on?" And so between their love interest and the dean of faculty, they both explain to them. So, hi, your life has changed. This is why. <laughs> <laughs> and so welcome to your new existence and you know we didn't want to just like let you go from an unfortunate accident and here you are now in this new existence and you know we're sorry we didn't get consent for you for this but at the same token you kind of have these badass abilities now so it's it's not really a bad trade-off and and so you know he's sitting there and goes this is so cool <laughs> <laughs> you know, he d- and he does a couple of you know, like, like really fast laps around the around the broom closet and you know the supply closet and whatnot. And then, um, you know, basically then uh, you know, basically the story ends as you know these the, these two young loves embracing now sharing this really special secret that you know he didn't even realize was part of who th- of who their love interest was. And now all of a sudden there's like wow there really are vampires in the world and the dean of faculty of all people is also one. What the hell? Well, this is cool. And so in the final, and so in the final scene, it's the, it's the, you know, it's the, uh, it's the utility closet opening, and the three of them walking out, and sort of like doing this badass walk down the hallways, the three of them together, knowing that they have their own special little secret together, and their own, and and you know, and their own new way of life of being together, and that's you know, in five pages, that's basically the gist of the story I told. Nice. Thank you. That's story. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Was there a question in there that possibly got covered up by other people talking? Did I hear someone ask a question? I'm just okay. an old. Yeah. 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 Cool. yeah. Yeah. Very I, creative. Yeah, I just I was just sitting there and I watched Heartstopper and I thought, what if I mixed a queer love story with vampires? So, so it's like, okay, fine. So Heartstopper meets Twilight. I can do something with that. And then I just sat at the computer and I just, I typed in five pages, just manifested themselves. Uh, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, and I, I even grew up um, in the times where you know, you know, I, I was born in the late '70s. I'm a, I, I'm a young Gen Xer, so you know, I'm, I, I grew up in the days of you know, vampires were evil and not that cool and so you know the newer trend you know in the last you know five ten years of vampires being cool and not quite so dark and evil and twisted and actually having a rather sexy trendy use you know in, in the in the in the narrative i um, mean you know, i've i've really you know while i grew up with the scary horror vampire and while i still have a special place in my heart for the vampire i do love with where the, i do love the new direction vampirism is going in terms, you know, in, just in terms of media narrative, and then also, also in terms of like vampire subculture, in general, um, I've found, you know, I've I've done lots of reading with that, and I find all of that quite fascinating. And huge fan of Michelle Balmain's work, um, and so I just thought, you know, if there's there, there's a new take on there's there's a new take on vampire story that can be told here. So I just I went with it. I love it. So thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. How does that, that story, or the creation of that story, affect your wisdom? Excellent question. Um, that's a really good question, actually. Let me ponder that for a moment. Um, so, I think part of it is just writing from the perspective that I understand. Um, that I, you know, that is my own lived experience, you know, huge vampire fan and also, you know, queer person myself. I'm, I've been, a uh, walking my truth openly as a, you know, as a cisgender gay male for 20 plus years. And so, you know, you know I'm, I've, you know, I, I have, I have experienced othering in my own life for, you know, over 20 years. I'm in my 40s now, and I came out as a teenager. I came out in the, I came out in the late 90s before Ellen did. Just, I just want to put that out there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was still not the safest thing in the world. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Nor, nor is it. I mean, for, yeah, it still is. for, for the, you know, you, you can go to certain places, you know, in India, in Egypt, being openly me, not a good idea. Um, in places in Africa, being openly magical, really not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, you know, just in, in various places of the world, it's still not safe to be me in any way, sh in, in, in any way, shape, or form. And so, you know, you know, part of, I, you know, I think part of tapping into wizardry and your magical self to begin with is just being truthful to your inner self and, and the core and essence of who you are. Um, you know, you. If, if you're putting on blinders to yourself, how potent, how solid is, is your magic? And yeah, so, that's you know, an and, excellent lesson. Yeah, and so like you know, the, the more the more truthful, the more open you are about who you are, the more clear your path is, and you can see where your path is going. And even whenever you come to a crossroads, like you know, you, you trust your instincts, you're fully honest with yourself. The path reveals itself to you which way you should go. And so, you know, there's, al there's also this element of, you know, I am a dark arts major, unapologetically. I love the dark arts. It's awesome. Um, yeah. You know, I've, I've, and I've, and I've, and I've, I've walked the path of the rebel by, 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 by being a gay man for 20 plus years. So, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely not opposed to, okay, fine, you want to cross me, you're going to have a consequence on that. And, uh, and you don't believe me? Well, okay, fine. I have, I have red brick dust right here. How hard do you want to play? <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, it was a brick that I made into dust. My bad. It's dust now. You're here on that one. Sorry. <laughs> snaps, snaps, snaps. <laughs> so you know, I mean, you know, I'm, you know, I love, you know, whenever I discovered this place, had, you know, this place by grade school, of course, um, had the dark arts major. I'm like, okay, not a lot of people are willing to talk about this. This is still a taboo topic. How are we approaching this? And then, you know, while I, you know, while well, I do understand that we don't necessarily teach how to do such things here. Um, we still get into them enough to understand kind of where they're coming from and how they can be done. And I appreciate that. And that, you know, that, that is a part, you know, that is an element of magic that absolutely speaks 
to my being. So you know, just right. my, my love of vampire lore. Anyway, just you know, the vampires, werewolves, ghosts, all those you know things that go bump in the night. You know, I love all of those things, and they're my they're my warm cuddlies. <laughs> <laughs> All of Yahoo groups. <laughs> <laughs> Yahoo what? <laughs> yeah, <it's> not <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's see how these words started. Yeah. It was the original forums. <laughs> Seems like you kind of stayed true to a, a paradigm. It's one of the ones that I really loved about Harry Potter. Was the storyline of Severus Snape? Yes. And how you know he's this big bad scary thing all the way through, and then at the end, it's when they find out. Oh wait. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't. You know. He turned out to be the goodest boy the whole time. Yes, right? Snape Still is my favorite. Yeah. Always. Me yeah. too, yeah. always. I, I love Snape. E even yeah. whenever he was being cocky and sneery and just all that stuff, just watching in the early years, it crap. And honestly, it's comic relief for me because I love watching it. <laughs> I would sit there and giggle at the movies I wasn't allowed to go to the opening nights because I would get the giggles in the wrong places. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and whenever, you know, the, the animals came out, I was always like, ah, you know. <laughs> I, I have friends who will not go into theaters with me because I will talk through the movie. But I also have a friend who does it too. So, we sit over here, the others sit over there, they don't know us till we're outside, and we all enjoy our movies. <laughs> right. That's the problem people have with me when it comes to movies. Especially if we're talking about some like major sci-fi or fantasy thing, because I end up pointing out like, okay, that's not how that would work. Oh, right. That oh, would never oh, function. Oh, my we have a huge Harry Potter fan like, that doesn't. Why is this small child using a structural eye beam with a handle as a weapon? <laughs> 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 that would split the moment. Even if they could somehow lift it, the moment they swung it, they would be flung off their feet. <laughs> well, right. that's mm. part of that. When I, one of this, one of this, I, I hate when my brain just kind of short circuits. Um, one of the psychology classes I took, I don't remember what the point was, but um, he had us read a, uh, a mystery novel and the person had been murdered and it was talking about uh, the, the, the crime scene people were there and they bagged their hands so they could collect evidence and they put plastic bags over their hands. And it wasn't psychology, that makes more sense. It was criminal investigation. But when is, they don't use plastic bags in real life, they use paper bags because plastic creates um, humidity, which creates a whirlwind and cleans all the evidence off from under the nails. So CSI actually uses paper bags, but that's a small detail that a, a writer doing their research would know that kind of thing. And I think that's one of the things about stories, they have to be believable. 
picture. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what draws you in. It's it's yeah. cool and all, but yeah. if it's if you can't make that leap, yeah, you're, exactly. you're not gonna stay with it. That's like right. with, with movies and video games and, and stories in general. The more grounded in some sense of reality yeah. it is, the more immersed it ends up being. And it like, can take for be. example. It yeah. can be out, outrageous. It can be a whole different world. But there yeah, still sure. has to be some kind of rules and structure yes. that you can get invested in and get your hands around. Mm -hmm. yep. Take, for example, the... Uh, uh, I don't know if, you, if any of you have read the series, but uh, the Dresden Files books by Jim Butcher. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal sense of rule system and structure. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. In that, especially when it comes to potion making and spells, where... I mean, the magic, you can technically do anything if with certain things in mind, but there's a, such a yeah. process you have to do, go through to get that, or a certain set of resources. the laws of physics. Exactly. Except, there is one rule he created, which if it's stood by... My daughter and I both flung our books for the last... Oh. Oh? Happy. Bad name. Murphy. Going to Valhalla. A soldier stays at Valhalla until they're no longer. Harry's gonna live a long time. Except for the fact that, um, uh, what was his alias in, uh. Oh, I don't remember. Dang it. Oh, he no. Had, he's, yeah, his, he's, he had an alias as a, with a, um, what's it called? Like a bodyguard, like a, mercenary yeah. company. Those people are Valkyries. Isengard... Einen... E... I... In... Something. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um... Einengarden... Einhejaren. Yeah, Einhejaren. Yeah. So there's, yeah, she... There's those folk like, yeah. and others that are, are Valkyrie, which... <sighs> yeah, and so they... She could easily return to the mortal plane. Yeah. Because, yeah, <laughs> his bodyguard was obviously... A Valkyrie. Yeah. So, yeah. But oh yeah, the immediate reaction was just horror and how could you and oh my god, where's the next book? And oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I've recommended the next ones. to people before. Um, I, I, mm -hmm. um, we are now at the point where a princess Medea. There you go. Um, Sorry for dragging the tangent. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have to step away from it. Dun, dun, I see the little, the little lines coming off the, but yeah, I don't see her name. There's some sound coming. Oh, there she is. Oh. oh. Hello? Believe nothing, that's a phantom. <laughs> Looks like maybe technical difficulties. They have, yeah. We've definitely had those today. Mm -hmm. If I could remember, well, if I could remember Provo Spanish from earlier, I'd say that in Spanish, but it is what it is. I heard a, I heard a gas. Well, it looks like she's. Her little thing is back up the on the voices. She has her name again. Mm.
Okay. I'm not seeing any, uh... Yeah, I don't see the lines either. Oh, there's that. There's like a hiccup or something. Uh, depending on what your setup is... Just say, if there is... Uh, I'm currently not on the Discord, hold on. Uh... There is no one in the Discord at the moment. Um, depending on your microphone setup, uh, do you, if you have, like, for example, multiple microphones, it may be the one it's currently connected to is not the one you're attempting to speak through. I've had that before where, for example, a VR headset across the room decided to take priority instead of my actual headset microphone. Uh, th that, might be, that might be why we're getting some little tidbits here and there, but it sounds either very quiet or far away, if it comes through at all. I spent the first month on Second Life when I first started doing this, not realizing that there was the little button there at the bottom that you had to push. Mm, there is that to, too. To talk and put the little check mark in it. So I'm running around going, my mic doesn't work, and spent a whole month doing this stuff without being able to talk at all, and then went, oh look, there's a button. <laughs> well, I mean, in the meantime, though, uh, how about that airline food, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, if if Midia is having um, sound difficulties, I mean, we can loop back around. Did we have? Do we have other people doing papers? I don't. Who's on the list? On. I was not ready. Um, he wasn't ready. I was not ready. Um, where is it? Okay. So this is the Meditation 201 class, the final that I did for it. Um, and the, the final asks three questions. What has changed in your perception of the mind and who you are? How has your practice of meditation changed during this course? And what is, what is the greatest gift you've received from this new perspective on your personal practice of meditation? Um, and I'll just read the paper. I'll just read what I wrote. Um, my perception of the mind and who I am have both changed dramatically. In fact, I am neck deep in redefining these concepts and feel that I am definitely on to something. This class has been instrumental in that journey. I have made it a practice to notice emotions as they arise, for example, and explore them with a little more objectivity. Obviously, that's sometimes easier said than done, but I've gotten pretty good at simply identifying an emotional response, such as fear or anxiety, for instance, and asking, where did that come from? It's interesting to say the least, and I'm finding that all sorts of old emotions and memories come up, something I mentioned in a previous essay. Some of these emotions and memories are true baggage, pieces of my life that I've been carrying around as evidence of who I am, the places I've worked, the people I've lost, the love I've felt, and I recognize them as such. But I also find things I had long forgotten, small instances of feeling alone or misunderstood, for instance, or just fake doubts and fears that have no real substance. It's like my ego needs these reminders to support the narrative it's created, like it's saying, look here, don't forget about this, so that I'll not push the envelope too much. 
and that keeps me feeling out of balance and disconnected from my past. But then I remember my practice. I remember that I am not those old fears and doubts, and I'm finding it easier to just look at those emotions and the memories or beliefs that they're attached to and say, I don't need that anymore. It's not who I am. That's not my truth. It's time to let that go. Sometimes that's easier to do than others, but I've gotten better at it. And in the process, I realized that I've spent a lot of time just waiting for what I thought would essentially be my turn. I'm a wife and a mom, and I've always worked a lot, in fact, and it was easy to just push the things I wanted to do for me to the side, believing that those things could wait. But they can't because I can't. I have to be as thoughtful and protective of myself as I am with others, and that realization alone has been game-changing for me. As a result of all this revelation, I've been really clearing things out. I feel the need to make space in my house, in my life, in my mind and heart, and I'm donating things and releasing energy, creating space for a new chapter, and I can see those efforts beginning to take shape in my life. I'm working out more and sleeping deeper, I'm cutting out things that don't serve me, whether it's bad vibes or bad food, and my self-talk is more confident, stronger, and balanced. It's like finally learning how to be comfortable in your own skin. Some of that, I think, is definitely and specifically from the meditative practice that I'm working with, and that continues to improve. Um, but I also think it's from the larger embrace of who I am. Discovering that I had clear senses in the core energy class was huge, for example, and those are also improving as I continue to work with them. Being part of GSW and actively growing my magical practice, stepping into leadership, expanding my own self-care, listening to my body and exploring my dreams. I'm even writing again, and that in itself is really exciting. As for my meditation practice, I continue to work with different methods and examine the results. I am really good with active meditation. Gardening, yoga, and painting are three of my favorites, and I found it much easier to calm the monkey mind when utilizing these methods. The random thoughts still come, but not as fast, and they almost always slow down to nothing. I think that's because I'm focused on whatever it is I'm doing, the pose, the landscape, the seedling, and it's just easier to ignore the chatter that normally goes on in my head. I used to really enjoy guided meditations as well, and sometimes I still find those useful, but more often than not, I find them to be distracting. That's been kind of disappointing. I really like some of the sleep meditations I worked with, but maybe this just means I'm getting more comfortable with my own voice. Chanting and drumming meditations are also distracting for me, but I've gotten much better at simply sitting quietly and focusing on my breath, and that's a definite improvement in itself. Of all the different meditation methods, focusing on breath was one of the hardest for me. I just couldn't quiet the chatter long enough to get something going. That's changed considerably, and I can now meditate for around 20 minutes, more or less, with nothing but breath. Overall, I think my meditation practice has come a long way, and it is the reason, I believe, I've been able to tune into myself and my body at these deeper levels. I also think it's helped me gain a deeper understanding of why I'm here. When I started, I was meditating because I thought I was missing something. The idea of meditating was becoming popular, and I did it because the experts said that I should. I think I was hoping to find whatever that missing piece was, that I would somehow connect to something divine out there, and it would show me my path. But now, now I know that all the connection I'm looking for is already in my possession. To find that divine, I just have to look within. Meditation is a way for me to strengthen and expand that connection, but it's never actually been lost. I just didn't know how to use it. To answer question three, what is the greatest gift, I'm going to point back to the bulk of this essay and say me. I feel like the deeper I go with meditation, the more I discover about myself. I'm learning to listen to my intuition again. I'm manifesting a path that feels in sync with a deeper purpose. I'm expressing my voice, and that in itself is pretty empowering. And I'm also realizing that at the core of everything is love. I am love. How amazing is that? I am rediscovering who I am, and I think meditation is a key component of that journey, one that I will continue to explore in future classes. The end. Thank you.
always wants to know where her console is. Where's her console in there? She can type in the code. Yes, I'm, I'm finding that out. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Well, and that goes back to what we were talking about earlier about um, the, that finding the balance and the negative and the positive and trying to get rid of we spend a lot of time trying to wash away um, what we don't like or bury it or hide it um, and I think at some point we have to learn to just accept it and, and yep. em embrace it and incorporate it let it become um, become something that we use not something that we try to hide Yep. That's actually the, the whole concept behind, uh, what is it called? Uh, shadow work, I believe it was called. Yeah. It's, that's the entire basis of that process. Well, and see, I had read a lot about that, and I always thought, oh, I want to do that. I want to do shadow work, and I couldn't figure out how to get started. And then I've kind of realized that that's, I mean, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a sit down and get started, you know, pull out your books, mm -hmm. and let's do shadow work. It's... Um, it's it's digging in and sometimes <clears throat> specifically with meditation um, I've found that some of my my heaviest baggage is stuff that pops up like out of nowhere I mean I'm literally when I say I'm looking at something going where did that come from that's been true for me it's just out of the blue and here comes this this painful memory or this this weird uh, belief that I didn't realize I was still carrying around and and then you kind of sort through it and figure out what's what's creating it for you what's causing you to hang on to it and that's the shadow work and you were really yep. just meditating that is by the way uh, when I got diagnosed with cancer that's how I got through that I had to embrace it and I know that sounds weird um, but that was, that was my turning point when I embraced it and said, okay, you're here, let's figure out why that is. Okay, let's see, I, the way that was phrased, I'm like, the cancer got you through the shadow work or the shadow work got you through the cancer? The shadow work <laughs> got me through the cancer, sorry, yeah. Um, it, was, it was facing it head on instead of trying to fight it. Um, okay. it, was, it was kind of dancing with it and saying, okay, tell me, you know, let me figure out why you're here. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> kind of good for us to have that happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys never know. Uh, all right, so I, I guess uh, Lydia is still having some issues, so I look like Is she posted on this right, the Discord? Yeah, she's. I think she like removed her post though, or someone it was there for a second, saying that she was just having, she could hear us, but she just couldn't get the mic working. Yeah. I'll let her know. Yeah, I, I uh, had yeah. gotten a message. Sorry, go ahead, Blair. Uh, she had sent a message and I just sit back, it happened a lot. It, it's one of the things we learned to flow with on the digital oh. landscape. <laughs> Many layers of technical difficulties. <laughs> no, no, the best one is when you're in the middle of a procession and you're the, the, I 
<laughs> and all of a sudden your computer starts to crash while you're walking through a tunnel for no explicit reason? Yeah. Yeah. That's like, whoa. You, you, you paint some imagery with your uh, completely chosen at random example. Yeah. <laughs> yes. it's just, don't, know, don't know where you're getting the reference from, but you know, it, I feel like it's happened very recently. You know. <laughs> Still fresh in mind. <laughs> It, it is, it does give us a valuable lesson in, okay, I've psyched myself up to do this and I'm getting it done, and then all of a sudden, wait, what? You know, that is, I call it the graceful check system. Because there is just times when no one can do it. Yep. You got this great plan, you got this great thing, it's all laid out, your X, Y, Z. Very nice. And then you go through it and then, oh, computer. Yep. Oh, right. But I think somebody pointed that out too. It might just be, you know, the Terry and energies. And as a fellow Capricorn, you understand. It keeps you humble. It's like you're you're getting a little too full of yourself to smash you in the back. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Capricorn, you know, it's three steps forward, two steps back. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, you know. <clears throat> Or you believe you can walk on water and it that you can't. It it does it it does it or it did force you to take a step back and maybe think about um, the energies that you were trying to acquire. It's like okay, you want to do this, then show that you have that leadership ability to do it. That would be a Saturn influence. And that you are going to persevere no matter what. Yeah. And and and, and as we know, in magic and, and life, there are no coincidences that that particular hurdle happened between uh, leaving the Stones Lodge and entering the Waters Lodge. Yeah. You know, it's the intersection of discipline and control and sort of the, uh, you know, unmotive knee jerk you might have uh, by. Uh, yeah. By can you, can you go there. with the flow? Yeah, it's, yeah. It, was, it was the perfect stumbling block. It's the, yeah. it, it it rhymes. There's <laughs> there's a function yeah. to it. <laughs> and those of those of you who, when when Sila and I met with Provost yesterday, and he was able to um, channel the uh, all four of the Eggermoors. Oh my God! To say, I was on the spot. That was. Yep. I was on the spot. It was that was so intense. It was a part of your brain went, oh crap, oh, water sink. Okay. No. Well, <laughs> Merc, Merc has Merc has a very I am here to serve kind of yes. um, yeah, approach to this, which is I mean we all love. Um, but Provost Provost channeling the different agrivores was he was like no. Why are you here? What do you want? He was challenging. It was it was intense. Yeah, he he does that. <laughs> he do that a lot. Yeah, at one point, I don't remember which one it was. Was it the Raven? He said, Merck started with, you know, I am here to supplicate and I beseech. And Provost just kind of cut him off and went, no, you want, you want me to share what I have with you and you come here on hands and knees? That's not a leader. Tell me what you want. Speak. It was just like, bam. I went, damn. <laughs> mm hmm That's awesome. Uh, but yeah, the, this is, I, I think, I think, Lou, I think we built something here to stay. This is something that yeah. I think is perfect. I agree. I think every midterm has a It is probably the most humbling, the most empowering, and the most come to Jesus moment. Because <laughs> you're facing the raw element. And don't worry, Mason. Let me 
America's team back home. So, one of these days we'll get you too. We'll get all the Americans, get the Americans <laughs> one at a time and make them block it. Let's yeah. Get them all back here. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, oh. too. I look forward to it. I look forward that, to it. Just to add to the tradition, can you imagine if every single person who went through it decided, you know what, their computer just craps out in the middle of the tunnels? Oh, yeah. The, oh, <laughs> right? Oh, <my> <laughs> Wouldn't that be the tradition? Oh, yeah. yeah. But it is a prime example, even on the digital scape, the point at which it happened has yeah, such know. meaning. Oh, yeah, because the, yeah, the transition in the caves transition from stone to water. And yeah. so it was, yeah, it was literally in that going tunnel with that your connects the lodges. You gotta go yeah. with the flow. It was yep. great. Yep. It was great. Oh man. And, oh, and a part of that was, okay, how are they gonna react? It wasn't just a test for you. It was a test for the ritualists Honestly, and the attendee. Oh, yeah, yeah. What are you guys gonna do this definitely at this point? Years ago, I'd have probably thrown a laptop at the company. <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness. Yeah, because I would never have accept, uh, accepted something like this. And uh, now it's like, you know what? That, that's good. Because even the, the. That's one thing that I love about the, uh, the Olympians. They were fallible. Oh, yeah. Leadership Massively. Be fallible, so that way you can. Mm -hmm. So that way there is no ivory tower, there is no infallibility of a toy. We, we're beyond that. We got millennials and Gen Z now. <laughs> so we're Old beyond, enough? We're beyond the baby boomer. This is the way it is because I said so. I didn't even raise my son with because I said so. Yeah, that never worked for me. <laughs> yeah. I would never take that as an as an option when my parents ever used that shit. <laughs> that would not fly. Oh, yeah. I'm sure we could all tell tales of, of getting in trouble for that exact challenge. <laughs> the, the, because I said so. Oh, my God. My wife's grandmother got... Just got, got God smacked because she did that to my son. When she was watching him, because I said so, he comes right back to it and says, That's not an answer. <laughs> what? <laughs> she, she, look like, and she had no reply. She, she just sat there. With, That's not how the force works. Like, <laughs> <laughs> She's like, Dad, she was scary. Yep. I raised my kids to not just blindly follow, and then they would just follow what I said. He's say that that's a, he's like, who told you that? He's like, my dad says that that's not an answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you were saying they're dad. trying to look innocent? Yeah, proud. I'm gonna talk with your dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh my gosh, that is so great. The, the look on her face, you were just like, oh god, I'll share with this moment forever. Oh, I, I know. It's the city wanted to crawl into his neck. <laughs> Alright. Um, no, it's a proud moment, yeah. you know? And, and honestly, that's what a lot of grade school wizardry is. Is just because someone said so isn't an answer. Right. Yeah. What's the mechanics of it? Give me the details. The cherry on the cake is this, uh, this don't touch that essay. <laughs> this was uh, the don't touch that essay that the Prentissuki author as a, as a, um, a film if necessary. And the nice thing is, is that this is the exact uh, essay that Apprentice Lux had agreed to, to offer in this time slot. So I'll go ahead and read this essay from Apprentice Suki. And, um, and that way we can, we'll, we'll use that to, to cap off the day and we'll send everybody on the way. Um, Sweet. So it looks like the Don't Touch This Essay, the Don't Touch That Essay, is... So there's like a bunch of scenarios that you can see here. And so it looks like you're, you're required to talk about three of these. 
So we chose scenario one, three, and nine. That's what they can do too. Scenario one is you walk into a home of a friend of a friend you never met. They have a really cool box on the table, surrounded by herbs, candles, statues, and all manners of glittery things. But it's all covered in a thick layer of dust. You really want to pick it up. You want to pick up the box and look at it first. What do you do? And so he replies, I learned this one the hard way. When I was 12 years old, I had a friend from Iraq who lived with his mom down the street from me. We were getting ready to go outside to play soccer, our favorite pastime. But his mom said he had to clean his room first. Knowing it would get us outside faster now, when it was clean, the junk when, when I was cleaning the junk off his bed, I knocked his pillow on the floor, and it uncovered the book with his strange tooth color. I picked up and tossed it to two and said, hey, what is this weird book? Now missing the catch, he missed catching it and the book hit the floor. He picked it up and repeatedly touched it to his head, speaking in Arabic. I kept asking him what was wrong and he would not tell me. He actually never told me in spite of our continuing to be friends for many years. Of course, years later, I realized that it was the Quran, and since it was sacred to him, he was he was either apologizing to Allah or accusing me out of Arabic or both. Either way, I learned my lesson that would definitely not pick up or open the box. Given the dust, I would not even ask the owner if I could pick up. And in scenario three, you're taking a hike in the woods and enjoying the scenery. You happen upon a small clearing to your right where you see a bunch of dried herbs, wax from a spent candle, and feathers, what can you do? For me, this one is a no-trace scenario. The basic rule to leave no trace when hiking is you leave everything the way you found it. While one could say picking it up is perfectly fine, my son, in particular, aggressively looks for litter on a hike out of the earth. This sounds more like items are not purely litter. Thus, I would be definitely wrong. And in scenario 9, you're at a graceful conclave, and you're familiar with most everything, everyone there. You and a friend walk by a pile of things that belong to someone else. On the top of the pile is a really cool lawn. The owner of the pile is not nearby and your friends uh, walk over and pick up the lawn and look at it. But he says, I would tell them to put the item back. Explain why they should not have picked it up and encourage them to tell the owner or the professor or prefect what they did. If they refused to do so, I would explain that I would have to inform the owner of prefect and professor, and they do so if they did not do it on their own. These, I, I like this lesson because this gives us the what if question. And this is, I, I like the fact that this is like, this is more like an ethics question. Yeah. And we, especially in leadership, we learned that half the job is ethics, half the job is organization. And there isn't nothing we do, there isn't nothing. 
But it's not black and white. It isn't. And that's the thing. Yeah. Because, because we're wizards, reality is a shade of gray, and everything in that reality is a shade of gray. I mean, yes, we're so white wizards, but we're honestly, I mean, just but listen, listen to what we do today. This is all gray magic. I mean, even the egregores itself is we're straight out of chaos. So, I mean, is, this is where this is where I like uh, there was a great book called Who Moved My Chief? And it's all about situational management. How to manage situations. And honestly, I think that's what we do. And scenarios like this give the wizard the whatever. And just like Marvel's what if, you know, if we were in a different universe and a different thing, you know, these different possibilities, I guess that's why I like Skyrim so, so much. <laughs> you know, they got mods. I want mods. I want mods in everyday life, trust me, to this belly. Hey. This belly and I want mods. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, but in reality, we can't rebuild our lives all the time. I spent the last 20 years rebuilding my life. I did, I'd do something for five years and then I would completely change the industry and completely change the career. I'm a certified vegetarian chef. I'm a PhD candidate. I, I've had more jobs than, than Christ had disciples. And, but that is not in, in society, you can't do that. You have to specialize. You have to, it's not trust. The fact that I spent so long in so many different areas, I lost trust. People didn't trust me because they didn't think I would stay. Focus. Uh, well, what they call focus. Basically, it's commitment. And just recently, I got into a little tip with the college and teacher. And I'm like, it was another kind of Jesus point. It was a scenario. It was like, what if they don't give me more class? And without a second thought, I said I would finish my apprenticeship in grade school and teach at grade school. I would teach nothing. So, why is that an option? Why isn't that the goal? And that happened this week, probably partly because of all the energy. Well, that's an awesome full circle kind of story. Yeah. They went through a new accreditation, and they wouldn't take four years of teaching as a part of it. So I, well, I'm okay. I, I petitioned for it, and so X, Y, Z, and I was like, okay, it's totally fine. And so for, for this term, I was already locked into one class. But they saw it in their wisdom not to give it to the So they called it for the next six months. So that I can focus on this. And if in the next six months I, I don't get another class, I can just focus on this. So it's, I'm not, I'm not losing anything because I didn't have the right focus. My scenario wasn't. so many scenarios that I've experienced in life that I don't know which one is And when these little come to Jesus moments happen, you see the 
Well, thank you. Are you are very welcome. This was awesome. <laughs> Sorry for all the coughing. I'm on a new medication. <laughs> no worries. Welcome. <laughs> so, this was an awesome day. You guys rocked it. I agree. Felt the energies flowing. The egregores are growing well and have gotten quite a bit stronger. Sounds like it, and <laughs> doesn't it? I can oh, absolutely see that again. as a Skinner song. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna check out. Um, but this was awesome. Thank you, Merck. Um, I loved it. Thank you, Siri, for uh, streaming for us. Yeah, it was such a huge, huge thing. Sure. <laughs> The full thing will be available eventually after uh, I marries them together. Merck, I don't know that you were standing there, but both Mason.